Amen, amen. Give God praise one more time, everybody. Uh, is, is that all you got? Give God praise. Hallelujah. He's a good God. He's a good God. No matter what we go through, no matter what we face, He's a good God. Amen. Turn to your neighbor and say, you look amazing. Turn to your neighbor. You are very blessed to be sitting next to me. These are my suffering days. But when my blessed days come, you'll be sitting next to my bodyguards. <laughs> Give God praise as you take a seat. Amen. Thank you so much, praise team. Uh, let's turn to the book of Hebrews, chapter number 9. It's good to have uh, Karabo in the house. Amen. Give God praise. It's good to have Carol in the house. Amen. <laughs> good to see you. Good to see you. Welcome. Welcome. It's good to have my wife in the house. Amen. Amen. Many times people will say, my wife, stand up so that they can see you. But I saw a preacher say, everybody stand up and see my wife. Amen. Hallelujah. Give God praise for my wife. Amen. <laughs> Amen. So turn with me to Hebrews chapter 9. And of course, the writer of the book of Hebrews is unknown. Where he's writing from is unknown. But we know who he's writing to. He's writing to people who are discouraged and flirting with um, backsliding and apostasy because they're under attack from the enemy. No matter how much the enemy attacks you, never leave God. No matter what bad thing happens in your life, no matter how bad it is, do not leave God. No matter how hard life gets, do not leave God. So this book is out to encourage people who want to give up. Don't give up, no matter what happens. Hebrews 9 verses 1 to 12. Then indeed, when the first covenant had ordinances of divine service and the earthly sanctuary, for a tabernacle was prepared, the first part in which was the lampstand, the table, and the showbread, which is called the sanctuary. And behind the second veil, the part of the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all, or the holy of holies, which had the golden censer and the ark of the covenant overlaid on all sides with gold, in which were the golden pot that had the manna, Aaron's rod that budded, and the tablets of the covenant. And above it were the cherubim of gold glory, overshadowing the mercy seat. On these things we cannot speak in detail. Verse 6. Now when these things had been thus prepared, the priest always went into the first part of the tabernacle performing the services, but into the second part the high priest went alone once a year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the people's sins committed in ignorance. So this is the first time that blood is mentioned in the book of Hebrews. The Holy Spirit indicating this, that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest while the first tabernacle was still standing. They had no access as long as this was in place. It was symbolic for the present time in which both gifts and sacrifices were offered, which cannot make him who performed the service perfect in regard to the conscience. Concerned only with foods and drinks, various washings and fleshly ordinances imposed until the time of reformation. Verse 11, but Christ came as high priest of good things to come, which the greater and more perfect tabernacle not made with hands, that is not of this creation. Verse 12, not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood, he entered the most holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. Father God, today we thank you for the blood of Jesus. Thank you for the eternal redemption that comes from the blood of Jesus. 
We thank you today for the lives that are saved. We thank you, Father, for everybody in here who's given their lives to the Lord. No matter what part of their journey they're in, the highs and the lows, the mistakes, the failures, they're all covered by the blood of Jesus. We thank you, Father, that there's still futures at stake. There's still destinies at stake. Every man and every woman in here, there's somewhere you're taking them. The next president could be in here. The next doctor could be in here. The next entrepreneur could be in this room right now. We pray, God, that you inspire them. Keep them strong in whatever season they're in. No matter how difficult it gets in their lives, Father. Father, I pray for those who, when they go through so much, they feel alone. I thank you that you're with them. I thank you that you care and you're compassionate and you'll never leave them. I also pray for those who are imperfect and struggling to live right. That God, you'll give them the grace and the strength to do what's right. Father, I thank you for those who are struggling with their faith and losing hope. I pray, Father, that they never lose hope today. May they see you and not lose hope. I pray for those experiencing frightening attacks and shocks. I pray, Father, be a shield and, and fight for them. I pray for those struggling financially, Lord, provide. There's a promise of provision in your word. Provide for your children. And I pray for those, Father, dealing with traumatic memories, that, Father, you bring healing and restoration. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen and amen. 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 Thank you so much. It's light. Hallelujah. Um, today's uh, word, my Bible talk is just simply the doctrine of atonement. Say the doctrine of atonement. Atonement, number one, in just the English dictionary, means the actions or steps a person takes to correct or repay or show they are sorry for something wrong they have done to someone. Webster says it's reparation for an offense or injury. To atone means to make amends. So when someone commits crime, uh, the judgment is passed. And to atone, they get told, for example, go to jail for the next five years and you will atone. Um, and you'll make amends. There's something you've done. Whenever there is an atonement, it means someone has done something wrong and they need to now pay a price uh, for the wrong thing they have done. Um, and then number two, atonement from a biblical perspective is the act of reconciliation between God and humanity through the offering of a sacrifice to pay for sin. That's what atonement is from a biblical perspective. In the Old Testament, atonement was achieved through the shedding of blood and the offering of animal sacrifices as a symbol of repentance and seeking of forgiveness. In the New Testament, this is achieved through the shedding of the blood of Jesus Christ. Number three, it's an important one on atonement. What caused Jesus to come down and die for our sins? What caused Jesus to come down and die for our sins? Two things. God's love and God's justice. Whenever we're thinking of Jesus dying for our sins, the two are inextricably tied. The love of God and the justice of God. Number four, saying the reason why Jesus came to die for our sins, um, it's because for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son is an incomplete statement because it only accounts for the love of God, but it doesn't account for the justice of God. Simply because the justice of God requires that sin must be punished. So instead of punishing us for our sins, Jesus died on our behalf as a substitute. So both the love of God and the justice of God caused Jesus to come down. It's both the love of God and the justice of God. 
sometimes when all you know is the love of God, you take your salvation for granted. You don't understand that you had committed crimes that deserved for you to die. Are you hearing me here? Number five, God is holy and his presence is holy. Sin cannot enter the presence of God. So his presence is shielded by a force field called the wrath of God. The wrath of God is the righteous anger and judgment of God against sin and evil. God is holy and just and cannot tolerate sin because it is an offense to his character and to his very nature. Therefore, the wrath of God is the appropriate and just response to human sinfulness and rebellion against God. Number six, what are we saved from? When you are saved, the question is, when you say, I am saved, what are you saved from? Look at anybody and say, what are you saved from? When you say you are saved, what are you saved from? Imagine you're walking um, in Stanton City, Golden, uh, Diamond, uh, Diamond, it's called Diamond Walk, right? You're yeah, definitely window shopping there, and you're walking past, and someone comes and tackles you from nowhere, and then they say, say thank you, say thank you, say thank you, and you're like, why are you saying thank you? If it doesn't tell you that there was an incabi about to shoot you, and I just saved you from what was about to happen to you, you'll be angry with him. And say, why are you saving me? But if they didn't catch you, you are going to die. Are you hearing me here? What are you saved from? What are you saved from? We are saved from the consequences of sin. Which are separation from God. And guilt. And the penalty of sin. Which is death. You are saved from death. You are saved from the consequences of sin. Number seven, was the death of Jesus necessary or was there another way for sins to be atoned? Couldn't God do it any other way? First, I must indicate to you, and this is very important for you to understand and believe today, God was under no obligation to send his son to die for you. Peter tells us that he did not spare the angels when they sinned. If he chose not to die for us, he would still be holy and still be good. But his love for us put him in a situation where by his love, he chose to save us. I will repeat this to you very carefully. You didn't catch it. He did not have to save you. He chose to because he loves you. It was a just, it would be a just decision if he did nothing. If he just left Adam as fallen, the entire human race is condemned to die. In that judgment that day, he could have said, every one of your offspring is born to live on this planet and then die for eternity. Everybody coming after you. But he chose out of his love. So number eight. It means we all deserved to die and go to hell. In fact, we all deserve to die and go to hell. Why? Because we are all sinners. We inherited a sin nature and everyone in here has sinned. There's no one standing in here who can say I've lived a sinless life. From, my, from the time I was born, pastor, I was worshipping. I was, I was born crying in tongues when... When I went to nursery school, I did nothing wrong. When I went to high school, I was perfect. When I went to my varsity days, Pastor, if you saw my varsity days, you see an example of holiness on a level like never before. Kunyepa, you are lying. We have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And the major mistake humans make is we think our goodness is what qualifies us for heaven. Especially people in the world who are not saved believe that their 
an inherently good person. I do good things, therefore I deserve to go to heaven. I do good things, I do charity work, I, I pay my taxes, I don't commit crime, I'm a good person, I, 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 I do the right votes, I do everything right, I, I'm a good person. You are, and no one on this earth is inherently good. Everybody is inherently a sinner. Are you hearing me here today? And uh, an interesting question is, why do bad things happen to good people? The question is, what defines a good person? Who is good? Who on this planet deserves nothing but good and no bad things happening to them? Which person is that? Which person can stand and say, I'm so good that nothing bad must ever happen to me in my life? We deserve bad and worse. Are you hearing me here? But God keeps us and keeps us going. Are you hearing me here? And we always underest or underestimate our sin and overestimate our goodness. And we start to think we deserve to go to heaven. None of us deserves to go to heaven. Even if you don't have... You know, there's some Christians with scary testimonies. Before I was saved, I was on crack, and I used to do human trafficking in Dubai. I used to, I used to chop up uh, body parts and eat them. There are some people with scary testimonies. And you are that Christian with boring testimonies. I was saved my whole life. I, 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 there was a time I backslid and listened to Coolio, uh, Gangster's Paradise. Uh, I was, uh, you know, that's the time I was in sin, and even that, those small sins are still sins for them. You are as bad. Oh my goodness. You don't deserve your salvation. Even if you were good from the time you were a kid till today, you didn't deserve to be saved. Number nine, justification is us receiving the atonement that Jesus made possible by faith. He makes the atonement possible then by faith we receive it. That's how we are justified. Number 10, atonement is what makes justification possible. How? Jesus on the cross. Um, there's two things which happened, and we need to write these words down. There was expiation and propitiation. <laughs> I can see you people just got saved last week. All you know is blessings and breakthroughs. And we make a wira koweka. That's all you know. You don't know about expiation and propitiation. Some Zimbabwean is going to name their child expiation banda. Are you hearing me here? Expiation is just simply the horizontal effect of salvation where God cancels our sins. He blots out our sins. Propitiation is vertical. This is where Jesus received the full wrath of God on our behalf. Jesus on the cross absorbed the full brunt of God's wrath for all our sins. And he is punished for our sins on the cross and makes whoever believes in him to be atoned. Are you hearing me here? Number 11, this is an important aspect of the doctrine of atonement. The transaction for our atonement was carried out between Jesus and God. Some people mistakenly say that Jesus paid the devil um, with his blood for our sins. That we were held ransom and Jesus when he died, he went to hell with his blood and said, devil, here's my blood, please uh, release my children. Uh, the devil was not involved in any aspect of the salvation transaction. It was simply between God and Jesus. Are you hearing me here? He is punished for our sins on the cross. And he presented his blood to God, not the devil. Because the devil will now be able to say, if I 
you're lucky. If I didn't accept the blood, you wouldn't be saved. So you must worship me. I helped you get saved. He was not in that transaction at any point and at any level. It's God himself saved you, not the devil. So that raises um, something more interesting again. Because Jesus is the mediator between God and man, not Satan and man. Which means we are actually saved by God from God. Let that sink in. We are saved by God from God. Hallelujah. Number 12. In the Old Testament, the use of blood to atone for sins was a central part of their sacrificial system established by God. The shedding of blood was necessary to make atonement for sin because the Bible teaches that the penalty for sin is death. So they would kill an animal to die for your sins, an innocent animal which didn't commit your sins. The poor lamb was just walking, man, enjoying living its best life. Singing, God did, God did, it's minding its own business. And then it is grabbed. And you're like, you're, you're like, Father, forgive me for my sins. And this lamb is going to die on my behalf. It's cut. Are you hearing me here? The shedding of blood was the way to symbolically represent what was supposed to happen to you. Number 13. The use of blood to atone for sin also served to emphasize the seriousness of sin and its consequences. We're living in this generation which thinks we can just be sinning and, and, and coming to church sinning and sinning and sinning and sinning because we don't understand its seriousness in the heart and in the mind of God. Sin and its consequences. Because we're not killing an animal every day for our sins. We, don't, we, we take it lightly. But it's meant to show you that it's serious. It's a vivid reminder that forgiveness of sin required a sacrifice and that sin has a high cost. Are you hearing me here? Number 14. In the Old Testament, the shedding of animal blood was required for temporary forgiveness. The animal sacrifice served as a substitutionary offering for the sinner, representing the sinner's repentance and seeking of forgiveness from God. We're now in a time where people say, you don't even need to repent, you're under grace. You don't even need to say, Father, forgive me when you do wrong. You are, you are just forgiven. You are so loved. Guys, you're just so loved. You don't have to repent, eh? Are you hearing me here? That's called flannering theology, madness. They are not okay upstairs. So this Old Testament blood provided temporary relief until the next time of sacrifice was required. But Jesus' blood on the cross provided a permanent solution for the problem of sin. Through his death, Jesus became the ultimate sacrifice for sin. And his blood was the perfect atonement for the sins of all humanity, past, present, and future. Jesus' death on the cross provides complete and final forgiveness for sin making it possible for humans to be reconciled with God. So atonement, some people say it means at one meant. It brings you and God together. The sin is dealt with, and now you can enter his presence without his wrath killing you. Are you hearing me here? Without the blood, you'd be dead we would all have died here singing Sefa Pano. Because all of us are sinners. We're not perfect. We would have immediately passed away. Are you hearing me here? Give the Lord praise for the blood of Jesus. <laughs> My case study today is from the Minister of Electricity. Uh, when President Ramaphosa announced on the 6th of March uh, this year that we're going to, for the first time, have a Minister of Electricity. Um, like most South Africans, I was very skeptical. And um, I gleefully dived headfirst 
into the flow of negative sentiment flowing in the sewers of Twitter and Facebook. But when he began to do these personal site visits, I paid close attention to what you were saying and doing at his site. And though Twitter and mainstream media remained skeptical and even began um, to ridicule him and mischaracterize some of his statements, one thing I noticed about this man is his approach to dealing with ESCOM was different from previous people. When he got to the site, he didn't come wearing a, a fancy suit. He came there dressed like them, like workers. And when he got there, he didn't go into a big office and say, bring the managers here. I want to sort out, I want to make everything proper here. There's too much corruption here. Call all the managers here. He didn't do that. He went down on the ground. He went into the factory. He spoke to some of the lowest workers, humbly communicating with them, showing them respect, showing them honor, finding out what's the problem, how can we fix it, and what must we do? You know, I believe in you people. I believe you can fix it. I believe he, he didn't come there condemning them and judging them, and he came to their ground and began to speak their language. Because every world is a language. If you want to succeed in that world, learn the language of that world. There is boardroom language. If you're not fluent in boardroom language, you will not succeed in the boardroom. There's corporate essay language. If you can't speak corporate essay language, you will not succeed in corporate essay. There's Bree Street rank language. If you don't approach the people there properly with Bree Street rank language, you will catch the wrong taxi. Are you hearing me here? Even in the taxi, there's taxi language. Short left. If you can't speak taxi language, could you please um, just drop me off at the turnstile, at the cul-de-sac? Can you kindly drop me off on the cul-de-sac? They'll be like, hey, hey, when? Robot, after the robot. Are you hearing me here? It's a different language. You can't come there with your boardroom language. Are you hearing me here? And then at the boardroom, you can't come start saying short left, short right. They'll be like, I don't think this person is good for this job. Every world has a language. And if you want to succeed in that world, learn the language of that world. Are you hearing me here? Even in marriage, there's a language of marriage. There's a way to speak to a husband where you get the best out of your husband. And then there's a way to speak to your husband where you get the worst out of your husband. And there's also a way to speak to your wife where you get the best out of your wife. And then there's a way you can speak to a wife where she'll become a knife. You will not survive. Are you hearing me here? If you want peace, there's a certain way you speak. Are you hearing me here? Every world has a language. Every world. Whatever world you want to get into, study the language. Study the language so you can know how to succeed and prosper in that world. So as soon as we enter this text, the first test that this text presents us with is our Old Testament acumen. And our proficiency, in particular, how fluently we speak Leviticanese, which is the language of Old Testament worship. As modern day Christians, if we're honest about it, a lot of us in here can confess that when we look at the Pentateuch, which are the first five books of the Bible, if we're really going to be honest in front of the Lord on this Resurrection Sunday, uh, a lot of us definitely need to repent on how we neglect these books. Simply because if we are honest, most of us uh, spend most of our time in the first two books of the Bible, Genesis and Exodus. But those three, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, we treat them like Kayaza Chiefs and Orlando Pirates. When it comes to winning the league, we are nowhere to be found. Are you hearing me here? In fact, we treat it like Tabo Besta treats prison. We disappear. 
Oh my goodness. Are we treated like Dr. Nandi treats bodies in free state? So the text presents a problem to us because the original audience of Jews, they were, not, they were conversant with the Old Testament. And so when this preacher is presenting to them um, the tabernacle, they are aware of everything he's talking about. But in our modern times, because we spend most of our study, and even in our preaching, we spend most of our time in the New Testament, and in the Psalms, and in the Proverbs, and uh, some of you know a few quotes from the prophets, some of you know, no weapon formed against me will prosper, Isaiah 54, 17, by his stripes I am healed, Isaiah 53, 5, and this one you definitely know, for I know the plans that I have for you. What's the scripture? Some of you don't even know the scripture anymore. This generation. Jeremiah 29 verse 11. For I know the plans. You are hearing me here. And you also know this one. Write the vision. Habakkuk 2 verse 2. But when it comes to the rest of the Old Testament, if you are honest with yourself today, you know mainly just the Bible stories. Joshua and Jericho. Gideon. Ruth. Uh, every Christian woman has heard about Ruth. Your Boaz. You can hear them praying. My Boaz was taken from me. I bind that wedding. Nothing will happen. Are you hearing me here? David and Goliath. And then for the deep ones, they know Elijah and Elisha. They can even tell you the trip of Elisha from Gilgal to, to Shechem to Bethel to they can tell you all the different places but when we look at the books of the law like Leviticus number and Deuteronomy if Deuteronomy didn't have I am blessed in the city and blessed in the field a lot of you wouldn't even pay attention to that book are you hearing me here because we treat the books of the law like how we treat our gym memberships after January. We never show up. Are you hearing me here? <laughs> so when we enter Hebrews 9, and we begin to look in the mirror of this word and this text, immediately it's going to show us how out of shape we are in terms of Old Testament fitness. And we're going to see how rusty we are when it comes to the book of Leviticus. You cannot unlock the book of Hebrews without Leviticus. And you cannot unlock the, you can, you'll never understand the power of the blood of Jesus if your Leviticus data bundles have expired. Are you hearing me here? You'll never know the power of the blood of Jesus without Leviticus. This week, read the book of Leviticus. Every day, Leviticus. When you read it, you shall see the power of the blood of Jesus that you've never seen before. So in order for us to navigate this text, I've put a structure together. The first section of this text is the sanctuary, which is verses 1 to 5. The second section, the services, verses 6 to 10. The third section is about the servant, verse 11. And the final section is the sacrifice, verse 12. The sanctuary in the old covenant is the tabernacle of Moses. In the better covenant, it's heaven. Um, the services uh, in the old covenant were daily and once a year. In the new covenant, uh, once and for all. Daily and once and for all. And then in the old covenant, there was the earthly high priest and then the better covenant, there's a heavenly high priest. And uh, the sacrifice in the old covenant is the blood of bulls and goats. And the sacrifice in the better covenant is the blood of Jesus. So in section 1, which is verses 1 to 5, you can start throwing up the verses. Um, the sanctuary section, the writer gives us a brief description of the tabernacle of Moses. He opens by saying, then indeed, even the first covenant had ordinances of divine service uh, and the earthly covenant and the earthly sanctuary. 
So in verse 2, he reveals this choice of earthly sanctuary for his expository sermon. He chose the tabernacle of Moses. Um, the first earthly sanctuary was Eden, where men would meet with God in the cool of the day. And then when Adam was kicked out, the next earthly sanctuary was the tabernacle of Moses. And then after that came the temple of Solomon, then the temple of Zerubbabel, and then the temple of Herod. The other three sanctuaries were very expensive. The first sanctuary was very cheap, very humble, made of earthly materials. And the reason why the writer chooses this instead of the others is to show us that um, a basic principle in the nature of God, in that God is not limited by our limited resources. In fact, God loves to choose ordinary people to achieve extraordinary things. So even your humble beginnings do not define where you're going in life. You can overcome a poor background and be successful in life. You can overcome a traumatic environment where there was always chaos, violence, abuse, and still become the most loving person after that. You can, sub you can go through anything with Christ Jesus and become something great. So no matter where you come from, don't walk around with low self-confidence. Believe in yourself because God believes in you. Are you hearing me here? So from verses 2 to 5, he describes the tabernacle of Moses in the text. He only describes the holy place and its three pieces of furniture. And then he describes the holy of holies with its two pieces of furniture. But for this presentation, I shall eisegete a little and add a description of the outer court and its two pieces of furniture. And following in the the footsteps of the homiletical approach of the book of Hebrews, where the preacher is exegeting the old covenant by comparing it with the new covenant and then driving the point that the new covenant is better than the old because of the superiority of Jesus. And he does this because the original audience was flirting with apostasy. They were contemplating going back to the old covenant. And the preacher is simply telling them that whatever you're going back to is an inferior world because Jesus is superior. And whenever the devil tempts you with anything, he can never tempt you with something superior. Whatever he tempts you with is always inferior. So when you say no to the devil, you're always saying no to something lesser. It's like Esau with the bowl of soup. He was tempted by a bowl of soup and gave away his birthright. Something superior for something inferior. The devil will never tempt you with something superior. It's always lesser than what God wants to do in your life. So that's why you must resist the enemy because there's something superior coming your way. Look at your neighbor and say, something great is coming my way. Ah, don't be jealous. Don't be jealous. Don't be jealous. Something great is coming my way. So they are in a hard place experiencing adversity and affliction. And they were thinking of going back to the old covenant because there was less resistance. And that's what Satan always wants to do in your life. Whenever we go through challenges, and we're experiencing pain and difficulty. He wants us to go back to our lives before Jesus. And pain and adversity can make your past life look more attractive. Ah, my goodness. I remember when I was a bachelor, there was a, a Friday where the spirit of loneliness came in my room. Ah, I felt so alone. And for whatever reason, a chaotic, toxic, demonic, satanic ex-girlfriend sent me a message. Hello, stranger. Have you ever been lonely? 
and receive a text from someone satanic, diabolical, triple six abomination, Satan's child. And in that loneliness, you actually say, but they weren't that bad. Pain can make what is bad look attractive. What God delivered you from can look beautiful. I saw a highly intellectual man who I respect tweeting, life was better in apartheid. I was like, you're not okay upstairs, sir. Brother Bernard, you are not okay. Pain can make the past look so good and attractive. But no matter what you go through, don't go back. Keep going forward. Because what you left was inferior and was going to destroy you. Are you hearing me here? Oh my goodness. You don't have to die to go to hell. Just marry the wrong person. Are you hearing me here? And on the same note, you don't have to die to go to heaven. Marry the right person. And no matter what circumstance you go through, it's going to be heaven on earth. So now from verse 2 to 5, he walks us through the tabernacle of Moses and lists each item of furniture in the holy place and in the holy of holies. And uh, before I step into the holy of holies, I have to indicate to you the spirit of the book of Hebrews. When he's comparing the old and the new, he's not doing it in a spirit of dishonor. He's not saying Jesus was better than Moses. He was better than Aaron. They were useless. No. In their time, though they were limited, they were pointing at him, pointing us to Christ. And some of us who come from hard backgrounds, particularly with difficult parents, we mustn't look back with dishonor. We must thank God that they were not perfect, but they put food on the table. The school I went to wasn't perfect, but I learned one plus one. The past where I come from was hard. But at the end of the day, it pointed me to Jesus Christ. Are you hearing me here? It was limited, but it was effective in its, pro, in its purpose, which was to point to Jesus Christ. So in the secondary sense of pointing us to Christ, we'll notice that everything in the tabernacle of Moses um, was like John the Baptist. They were there to show the light, but they were not the light. John 1 verse 18. Their job was to point to Jesus Christ and the entire book of Hebrews, the writer is basically telling them that the old covenant like John must decrease so that Jesus increases. John 3 verse 30. And uh, the Old Testament is simply designed to point to Jesus Christ. And it's a tragedy today. If you can open the Bible, the Old Testament, and not see Jesus. We've got preachers who can preach from the Old Testament and not mention Jesus. They can see everything else, but not Jesus in the Old Testament. They can see your anointing. They can see the satanic altars formed against you. They can see your generational curses. They can see your money. They can see your husband. They can see your enemies, but they can't see Jesus in the Old Testament. Spurgeon said, Do you not know that from every little town and village and every tiny hamlet in England, there is a road leading to London? Whenever I get a hold of a text, I say to myself, there is a road from here to Jesus Christ. And I need to find it and track it till I find him. Unquote. In every book in the Old Testament, in every verse, in every chapter, in every line, there is a road that leads to Jesus. And there's a powerful anointing that comes on your life when you read the Old Testament intending to look for Jesus Christ. Are you hearing me here? There is a power and anointing that even comes in your preaching when you read the Old Testament to preach. 
bring out Jesus Christ. And that's what the whole book of Hebrews is. It's a preacher teaching us how to use the Old Testament to reveal the new. So to illustrate this, um, Tim Keller gave us many examples. Uh, but uh, the two which I really like are the example of Abel. He said, Jesus is the true and better Abel, who though he was innocently slain, his blood now cries out not for our condemnation, but for our acquittal. When Abel got killed, the Bible said his blood cries out. Abel's blood, when it was crying out to God, it was crying for justice. It was crying, Lord, I've just been killed. And Lord, you need to do something. You need to atone for this. You need to make sure that Cain is punished. But when Jesus died and he spilled his blood, his blood was like, forgive them, for they know not what they did. His blood doesn't cry out for our condemnation. That's why it's greater than Abel's blood. His blood cries for our freedom. His blood cries for mercy. His blood cries for our deliverance. His blood cries for God to make a way for us. His blood cries for our protection. His blood cries for our rehabilitation. His blood cries for our healing. His blood cries for our strength and for our peace. Abel's blood cried for justice. And Jesus' blood cried for grace and mercy. That's what makes his blood better than Abel's. Then another example is, he says that Jesus is the true and better Isaac, who was not just offered up by his father on the mount, but he was truly sacrificed for us. When God said to Abraham, now I know you love me because you did not withhold your son whom you love from me. Now this verse, it's, it, it, they like to use it to give tribute, to give money, this one. So, they, and they totally miss the significance of it. He was willing to give his only everything. When now you can't give nothing. Then listen to this. Says, now we can look at God taking his son up the mountain and sacrifice him and say, like God, God said, now I know you love me because you did not withhold your son whom you love from me. So the story of Abraham and Isaac here, the Christ factor is now we have to see Abraham walking up as God, presenting his son and actually killing him. And then the words which God spoke to Abraham, we have to turn around and actually say them to God. Now we know that you love us because you did not withhold your son your only son whom you loved for us. Jesus is all over the Old Testament. It all points to Jesus. And this week when you open the Old Testament, look for Jesus. Look for Jesus. He is everywhere. He is everywhere. He cannot be missed. He is all over that book. Look for him. Are you hearing me here? So now we're going to go to the tabernacle and look for Jesus. So in the outer court on the east side, the first um, furniture is the brazen altar. And the brazen altar was a place of sacrifice where animals were killed for forgiveness. It represents Jesus dying for our forgiveness. The bronze lever, which is right in front of the bronze uh, altar, was a place where they would wash their hands from all the blood sacrifices they've made all day so that they can go into um, the holy place or the inner court. So the praise and lava represents Jesus washing away our sins so that we can enter God's presence. In the inner court uh, or the holy place, to the left of the priest would be um, the golden lampstand. And to the right would be the table of showbread with 12 loaves of bread. And right in front of it would be 
uh, the altar of incense, just before the veil that separates the Holy of Holies and the Holy Place. The golden lampstand had light, which represents the truth of God and wisdom. And uh, these two things, the lampstand and the showbread, show us things that God provides for us through our salvation. So the light represents the truth of God, which gives us direction and wisdom. The mark of a Christian should be, if you're a Christian, you're someone who must have direction. When you don't have direction, you're not representing the kingdom of God. Are you hearing me here? Someone who is in, the, and direction is simply having a vision, having a purpose, having a dream, having somewhere you are going. Where are you going? That's a sign of the kingdom when you're someone who has direction. Have you ever dated somebody without direction? There's weeping and gnashing of teeth all the time. And the next thing, which the other mark of a Christian is wisdom. Say wisdom. Um, in describing wisdom, Waltke calls it the skill of how to successfully live under God before humankind. Wisdom is a skill which shows you how to live under God's authority in the presence of human beings. Anytime there is foolishness, there's a violation of the knowledge and the fear of the Lord over your life. Because when you are wise, you understand that God is watching me and I'm representing him in this situation. So I cannot be a con artist being hunted down by the government. That's an act of foolishness. It shows I do not fear the Lord. And because anytime I don't fear the Lord, foolishness comes. And foolishness always produces death and destruction. Are you hearing me here? So you need wisdom, which is powered by the fear of the Lord. And the fear of the Lord is powered by your knowledge of God. When you know who God is, how big he is, his nature, his power, his glory, his immensity, his eternity, his acity, his omnipresence, his, his omniscience, and you see how great he is, it, it has to affect the way you think, the way you live, and the way you conduct yourself in front of people. You can see somebody who doesn't fear God. Are you hearing me here? And sometimes there are some people who might not be very churchy, but they still fear and respect God. And then there are some people with no fear of God. In this country, we've seen people who can go in a church and stage an armed robbery. Go in with guns in the presence of God to steal money. No fear of the Lord. If you track those people's lives, you're just going to see death and destruction and poverty and curses upon their lives. They have no fear of God. But trust me, God always gets those people. They never make it in life. They never go far in life. Because when you don't fear God, you don't have wisdom. And you don't know how to conduct yourself in front of people. The other thing wisdom is, Koch, Geese, and Schmid describe wisdom as the search for order, number one, and the mystery of the deed and destiny nexus. People who, are, who have wisdom are people who like order. Fools like chaos. When you're in a foolish environment, there will be litter everywhere. Any place in this city where there is litter and there's Urinating, the people in that environment are not exercising wisdom at the taxi ranks. It's just a bunch of crazy, even the driving, they don't exercise wisdom. Are you hearing me here? Wisdom changes everything about you. You like order. You like things that are in order. When you enter a restaurant where there's no order, you know there's no wisdom. Are you hearing me here? What is your order? They come again. Did you order chicken or? Then, okay, I got it. Then they bring fish. Here's your order. There's no order. Are you hearing me here? Any place where there is no order, it's a lack of wisdom. Because wisdom will always bring order. 
And not only that, wisdom is concerned about the deed and destiny nexus. In other words, wisdom shows you how to behave yourself to save your future. Because wisdom's main concern is your future. Wisdom has no grace. Are you hearing me here? If you are foolish, wisdom will judge you brutally. Wisdom doesn't deal with gray areas. If you are lazy, you won't prosper. That's what wisdom says. If you are lazy, you're not going to prosper. I don't care how much you pray. I don't care how much you sing. I don't care how many times you go to church. But if you are lazy, you're not going to make it, said wisdom. Are you hearing me here? Are you hearing me here? Wisdom is ruthless. She commands a certain behavior from us. Wisdom demands that you do things differently because wisdom creates your future. And when times are dark, like right now in South Africa, we need the light of the golden lampstand. The wisdom of God will show us what to do, how to prosper, how to succeed, how to put food on our tables, how to do well. No matter what load shedding, no matter what basis points, no, no matter what challenge they throw our way, the wisdom of God will show you what to do. If there's anything you must pray for every day, pray for wisdom. Say, God, give me wisdom. Lord, I need your wisdom in my life. I need your wisdom for my marriage. I need your wisdom in this company. How do I rise in this company? I need your wisdom in South Africa right now. How do I succeed? I need your wisdom so that I build a, an amazing business and a future for my children. I need your wisdom in relationships. I, I need your wisdom every day in every way. I need your wisdom. I pray for the wisdom of God on your life. This is a week where you're going to get wisdom like never before. You're going to get ancient wisdom, wisdom which Abraham had, the wisdom Isaac had to sow in the middle of a famine and succeed. The wisdom Jacob had to wrestle with God and to overcome spiritual warfare. The wisdom of Joseph to command an economy. I pray for the wisdom of Daniel on your life to open doors in tremendous places and solve complex problems. I pray for the wisdom of David on your life to be a creative who produces high quality creative content. May the wisdom of God come upon your life to create inventions that will shock the world. May God give you wisdom of how to move from poverty to riches. It doesn't take connections. It takes wisdom. All it takes is wisdom. All you need is wisdom. All you need in your life is wisdom. When you are lonely and they send that SMS, wisdom will say, delete and block. You don't need to go back to that. Wisdom will change your friendships. Wisdom will change South Africa. Wisdom will change your family line forever. You break poverty in your family. You will be the one to bring everybody out of poverty. Through the power of wisdom. I pray for the power of wisdom in this church. May some young man or young woman walk into wisdom. May the spirit of wisdom and knowledge come upon your life. May God show you how to solve every problem you're facing. Don't be stressed. Don't be discouraged. Pray for wisdom. Wisdom will show you you're not a victim. Wisdom will show you you're a fighter. Wisdom will show you that nobody owes you anything. Wisdom will let you get over the people who let you down and show you that God is with you. And if my God is for me, who can be against me? What can stop me? Nothing can stop the power of wisdom. When wisdom comes on your life, the devil can't stop you. The devil gets nervous when he sees a Christian move in wisdom. Christians who move in wisdom succeed on a level like never before. And they're able to say, I'm not self-made, I'm God-made. God made this. God did this. You didn't believe in us, but God did. And 
God gave us the wisdom to break through. I pray for the wisdom to break through your situation. Whatever you're going through, it's not impossible. Don't be a victim laying down discouraged. Lift up your heads and say, God, put some wisdom on my brain. Oh my God. Ah, wisdom has got nothing to do with education. You might have a standard six or a grade one or a grade zero, but wisdom, they are educated fools. I've seen highly educated fools. Wisdom is greater than education. They'll give you a PhD just because you're wise. The devil is a liar. I pray for wisdom on your life. May the wisdom of God show up on your life. In the mighty name of Jesus, Lord, give us wisdom. Wisdom to break the curse. Wisdom to build families. Wisdom in this season. Devil, get out of my way. Solomon was asked by God, what one thing do you want? Do you want money? Do you want women? Do you want power? Do you want politics? Uh, but Solomon said, Lord, give me one thing. The one thing that I need. Uh, and that one thing is wisdom. And God said to Solomon, uh, you're the first man in my life uh, who has prayed for wisdom. Uh, and I promise you from today, you shall be the wisest among us. Uh, and because of wisdom, uh, Solomon became uh, the richest man ever. Because wisdom has the power to break every curse over your life. Uh, wisdom has the power uh, to take you from the bottom uh, all the way to the top. Uh, in this season, I pray uh, for the wisdom of God uh, to come on your life. Uh, you have suffered long enough. You have cried long enough. Uh, you've struggled long enough. Uh, it's time for some wisdom. Uh, seek wisdom this week uh, with all of your might. Uh, Open up the Word of God uh, to the book of Proverbs. Uh, you've got to look for wisdom uh, in the book of Proverbs. Uh, it's a wisdom book. Uh, and in the book of Proverbs, uh, the writer will tell you, uh, look for wisdom uh, more than silver and gold. Because uh, if you find wisdom, uh, Silver and gold will find you. Uh, stop striving in your life. Uh, stop struggling in your life. Uh, seek the wisdom of God. Uh, there is wisdom uh, for what you're going through. There is wisdom uh, for the battle you're fighting. Uh, there is some wisdom uh, for the situation you're going through. Uh, I need somebody in here uh, to tell the devil uh, I'm coming out, I'm coming out, I'm coming out, I'm coming out uh, in the name of Jesus. Uh, I'm coming out uh, of this situation. Uh, I'm coming out, uh, I'm coming out of debt. Uh, I'm coming out. Uh, of unemployment uh, I'm coming out uh, of discouragement uh, I'm coming out by the power of wisdom uh, I need somebody uh, to give God some praise uh, I need someone in here uh, praise the Lord uh, praise the Lord uh, yeah Wisdom, 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 wisdom. I impart 
wisdom in your life, wisdom in your family, wisdom in your marriage, wisdom on your career, wisdom in your finances, wisdom, 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 wisdom. Say, I receive wisdom. Let's stand. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Holy Spirit. We refuse to be victims. We shall exercise wisdom. You shall show us what to do. You shall show us where to go. You shall show us how to do it. You shall show us the light in the middle of darkness. The golden lampstand gives us light. It shows us how. It shows us where to go. It shows us who to fall. It shows us what to change. It shows us where to apply. It shows us how to talk. It shows us how to build. It shows us how to grow. It's the wisdom of God that you need. On this day, the Holy Spirit is saying, all you need is wisdom, my child. God loves you too much. He's not forgotten you. He's not forgotten all the service you've done to, to Him. He's not forgotten every tithe. He's not forgotten every gift. He's not forgotten you, my child. There is wisdom. He's a faithful God. He's a blessing God. He's a providing God. He hasn't forgotten you. And He's saying right now, you need wisdom. You need wisdom in this season. Wherever you are, whatever you're dealing with, you need wisdom. Look at your neighbor and say, I need wisdom. Oh, Shambara Basantara. My bishop used to tell me whenever I'd meet him, he'd say, pray hard for wisdom. Hard. Wisdom changes things. Are you hearing me here? Amen. Now we're going to take communion. Amen. You can give the elements to everybody. I also need one. If you could get that to me. It's going to take communion. Hallelujah. Say wisdom, 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 wisdom. Wisdom. Thank you. the bread say amen the bread was also in the tabernacle the table of showbread Jesus says this bread represents his body that is broken on our behalf and this bread also represents the veil which was torn in two for us to be able to access the presence of God so this bread represents Jesus tearing the veil so that we can experience our Father and get into right relationship with Him. As you take this bread, meditate on His body which was broken on your behalf. Amen. This represents the blood of Jesus which was shed for our atonement. What makes this blood powerful is it was sinless and divine. He couldn't be born of a man. He was born of a woman and the Holy Spirit. He couldn't have the infection from Adam's blood. His blood was pure and sinless. Because he was fully God and fully man, it's also divine and timeless. So when he presented this blood, 
it, the Bible says it was once and for all. Once and for all. All your sins are forgiven. Once and for all. Let's drink. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Father God, we thank you today for the blood and the body. We thank you today for atonement that you have paid it in full. When you said it is finished, it meant that the price is paid in full. Every debt that your children could ever have is paid for in full. Even your children who are struggling, Lord, with this journey, making mistakes and battling to live right. Some days they good, some days they bad. Your blood has covered that. They are forgiven. And we thank you that you're still working on them. And they will get it right. They will live right. And Father, please don't take away your spirit from them. Stay with them. Keep helping them. Keep encouraging them. Keep convicting them when they're wrong and directing them in the right. And may they never ever lose their passion for you. Because we know that Lord, you love, you love, you love, you love. And you won't stop loving us. We thank you today, Father, that all sins are forgiven. Everybody in here is forgiven. There's no way the enemy can snatch them out of your hand. Every person in here, Father, is covered by the blood of Jesus. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen and amen. Give the Lord a praise. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.